Hello, everybody! Oh, God, I hate that so much. Welcome to Ugh. Men Who Talk Through Movies as we talk about our segment of the men in the movies. I am your host, Jess Jeb mm -hmm. Schaefer. And with me today is someone who has never been a host or a guest. He's been a host, but never a guest on his own content. Say hello, Stephen. I regret this already. Continue. You know, you'll get used to it. You will get used to it. Uh -huh. So yes, with me, Stephen is going to act. Stephen is going to be the one who talks about his favorite man from his favorite movie. Because yes. that's what we're here to. We're, we're men. We talk yes. about movies. So, and we want to talk about the men who have inspired us or made us feel something or, you know, stuff like that. So, Stephen. Yeah. Who do you have for us? All right. So, we all know Tom Cruise, right? Ah, uh, yes. The Scientologist. We've all got our cringy moments that we think of when we think of Tom Cruise. We've either got a crappy movie or we've got a really weird thing that he's done in his life or we've got his hilarious character in Tropic Thunder. Something comes to mind when we think of Tom Cruise. Or you think of Maverick. That's true. That's true. Which I still need to see that movie. Okay, so uh, when you guys see this, because this will come out a lot later than when we're recording it. We're kind of backlogging stuff. But um, as of recording this right now, like... This upcoming uh, Saturday, I'm going to see it with my father-in-law. I'm going to see the the uh, new one, Top Gun Maverick. I'm so pumped. It's going to be exactly as cheesy as the first one, and it's going to be exactly as exciting, and I'm so ready for it. It's actually, I've heard it's actually better than the original. I, I've heard that they kind of tamed down the love story, which was kind of the drawback on the first one. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Anyway, but we're not here to talk about Maverick as That's much right. as I would love to. That's right. As much as I would love to. Yes, we're so we think of Tom Cruise, ready? A movie of Tom Cruise's that is actually fairly popular and yet most people still forget about it. The Last Samurai. Mm. I love this movie. Now, there are very few movies. I don't want to say that entirely, but there are some movies that in my family we pass down from generation to generation for my family. The last Sam it, it's, it's fly boys for some reason. It's fly, fly boys. boys. Oh, forgot about that. But that's a yeah. really good movie. It's, it's, it's a good movie. It's, you know, it's got, it's, it's, it's like uh, top gun and it's cheesy, but yeah. it's, it's got a lot of really good qualities. I could have talked about him as one of my characters as well, but I wanted to talk about, the character in The Last Samurai, played by Tom Cruise, Nathan Algren. Uh, he is a uh, a retired military leader from the United States who gets called over to Japan to help Japan in their efforts with an insurrection within their government. So the way the way the basic setup works is um, the Emperor of Japan. Uh, one of his trusted uh, leaders and mentors is not pleased with the direction. And this is somewhat based on a true story. There's some issues with it. And the real life character is not as noble as the Tom Cruise character. But I was so impressed with the character that Tom Cruise played that I didn't care what the history was because this character was so endearing to me. So uh, basically the, uh, the emperor has this uprising against him and it's being led by one of his advisors who is a traditional samurai who is not fond of the new ways of life. This Western way of thinking uh, is not a fan of the new technologies. And so they're leading a rebellion based from their former samurai ways. And so what happens is he leads troops into battle. He trains them up as best as he can, but he says they're not ready. They get sent into battle anyways. They get absolutely clobbered, and he gets captured by the samurai. They treat him well, and so during the time that he's captured by them, he starts to fall in love with their way of life and ends up converting to their side and fighting against the emperor. And by the end of the movie, and this is... Y'all know how we are with spoilers. We really don't get two craps. By the end of the movie... um. They are defeated. The samurai are completely wiped out almost. Like the, the, the village people are fine, but the warriors are wiped out. And he comes, Tom Cruise's character, uh, Nathan Algren comes. He presents the sword of the emperor's former teacher. And this is a moment where the emperor has to realize 
We can't forget where we come from. We have to remember who we are and who we were and learn from the things from our past. And I find it is a very beautiful moment because not only does Nathan Algren have to wrestle with the person that he was before, he, re- he gets flashbacks of these times when he was, uh, w- when he was leading these battles against uh, Native Americans. And there's some things that he did during those times that really haunted him. No, I, I, there are people that will tell you, and I, and they're correct, that some of the stuff you hear with the Native Americans in the U.S. is a little twisted and not entirely true, but there were terrible things that the U.S. government did in addition to some of the lies that you hear. Some of those things that you hear are actually true. The U.S. government did not do everything perfect and golden. And you watch him as he wrestles with these things and these memories while he's being captured by this people. And so part of the reason why I fell in love with him is he has to wrestle with who he is and the things he's done, come to terms with it, and then he has to choose now in the time being the kind of man that he's going to be. And I just, I don't know, it's just, he's always been a character that's just been very personal to me and someone I feel like I could understand a little bit if I knew them in person. Okay, so I want to ask, I kind of asked, answered this question, but you kind of just answered this question, so I need to think of a way to reword it so you're not a- answering the same question twice. But okay. What made you fall in love and make you, I feel, what That's made okay. you fall in love with this character? And again, like you said, if you want to elaborate on that a little more. It's going to come as a a little bit of an odd answer at first, but I'll explain it. It was honestly the guilt that he felt that made me relate to him. Now I've, you know, I've I've not slaughtered innocent people or anything like that and I've honestly like most people would consider the things I've done to be pretty tame, mm-hmm. but uh the way that he carried so much guilt on his shoulders from the things that he did made him feel like such a relatable personal character to me mm-hmm. because He's done these things that he regrets and he can't escape them. Like he's, he's a struggling alcoholic and he can't just dive into the bottle and forget those things. He's not the kind of character that's just like, I've done these things, but I've got a redemption arc. And so now I'm going to be better and no one's going to remember the things I don't know. He has, he has you Steven universe. Yeah. I love, I mentioned in an, in an episode, that's one of my like, favorite shows like b-list tier of my favorite shows yeah that's exactly what they did yeah and like I-, I get it like it's it's great to have a redemption story but if if you're gonna have a redemption story you need to have them wrestle with those those regrets and not just the regrets but the shame that they felt and that's something that nathan does all throughout the film you see those flashbacks you see the flashbacks of him holding the gun and shooting down a child you see those moments flash before your eyes over and over. He's never going to be able to escape those things. And the movie admits that. It admits mm. he's never going to be able to forget those things. But what really draws me to it is, even though he's going to carry that with him for the rest of his life, in this moment here and now, he's going to tr- he's going to try to do what he believes is the right thing. He may not be able to undo what he's done in the past but he's going to try to do the right thing now while he's still got the breath to do it. I'd say that's what drew it to me first is kind of the guilt he felt and the sense of duty. For some reason, I I noticed this in my personal devotion. Duty is a big thing for me. Uh, This sense of like obligation of this is something that I need to do because it's mine to do. Nobody else can do this. You know, nobody else can be a husband to my wife. That's me. That's only me. And so while it's not, I think, the the ultimate reason that you need to do something, I think that uh, the love and the compassion that you have for other people should be a stronger reason, that duty is still a strong enough sense that even when you're not feeling it, it pushes you to do the right and good thing. And he's got such a strong sense of duty to doing the correct thing, doing what is right in his eyes, what he believes is the morally correct thing, 
that it continuously pushes him to becoming a better man. And eventually he gets to that point where he's doing the right thing because he loves these people and he has a love for this unity and he wants to see unity between the emperor and his people. Okay. Uh, so my next question then, would you say Nathan is a character that we should strive to be or is it an ideal? I think I worded that right, but almost 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 yeah that the strive to be an ideal is kind of the same thing well you know the question the, i'm trying to ask the, re, the relatable or the ideal to strive for that one yeah <laughs> and all good um he is not the ideal to strive for and the reason is just because of all of the sins of his past um now while he does things that are indeed noble and while he does things that are indeed good, I don't entirely think that he's the ideal to strive for. He's more of the person that you see and you're like, I I may not have been through what he's been through. I've you know, I'm not up against an emperor. I'm not trying to save a people from being wiped out. But the feelings that he's feeling right now, I feel like I've felt those before. And it, it it's kind of like when you're watching at this moment of this moment of realizing I don't have all the answers and some of the answers that I thought were correct along the way are probably wrong. And I'm going to have to wrestle with that guilt the rest of my life. I, I wouldn't say he's an ideal to strive for because even in his moments of trying to do the right thing, he still kind of falters a little bit. He, mm -hmm. He's still got things that he's got to carry with him. You watch in his uh, in one of his battle sequences, even when he's fighting for it, as the movie portrays, not necessarily in real life because it's a little bit more gray than that. But in the movie, when he's fighting for the correct side, there's a battle sequence where he's approached in the hallway by a couple of the emperor's assassins. And, you know, in self-defense, he ends up killing every single one of them. And so you watch... After that moment happens, all of those moments, just like when he's having those flashbacks with the kids and the Native Americans, he's having those exact same flashbacks with these men that he's just killed in the alleyway. And he's realizing that even though he's standing for the correct side, he's still doing things that he regrets. He's still doing things that he would rather undo. And so I'd say, yeah, he's he's not necessarily an ideal to strive for, but he's someone that if you if you're sharing those emotions, he's somebody that you feel like you can relate to a little bit. Yeah, because I I can speak for myself, too. Again, I know this is your interview portion, but I can speak for myself. I'll give you permission. Oh, thanks. Thanks. But we we've all as humans have had that, you know, because because of our sin nature, sadly, guilt and shame is a part of life and it sucks whether it's nights where you cry yourself to sleep. Cause you're like, why did I do that? Why have I done that? Or nights where you can't fall asleep because you're just driven by guilt or maybe your guilt is because you're just so heavy with it. It just puts you to sleep because there's nothing else you can do. Mm -hmm. We've all had that moment of guilt, but like Nathan in the movie, from what you've explain to me because i have not seen it in so long and i might watch it after this interview so but, good dude you, you're you gonna be floored by how amazing I, it is i oh no well, like i've seen it two or three times and i've enjoyed it every time but it's like i think the last time i watched it was probably five or six years ago yeah but like but like nathan it's what are you gonna do about it like are you going to keep living in this regret and this shame or are you going to in a sense fight for what's right or do what's right. Are you going to step up? And for example, as Christians, are you going to go to a more mature brother in Christ or a brother in Christ in general and just say, Hey, I need your help because of X, Y, and Z. Hmm. Uh, this is an interview. I need to think of another question. <laughs> uh, favorite moment in the movie he did. 
Ooh. Like, what, like, because I know you mentioned like why you love the character and he's relatable because of this. So, mm -hmm. what is his favorite moment that you saw him do in the movie where you were like, "This is why I love this character." It's not because oh he's relatable because of this, but what action did he do in the movie that make you say that is what I wanted? You know what I'm trying to ask. I feel like I'm as I keep talking, I'm confusing it, but you yeah. get what I'm trying to ask. I get what you're trying to say. Um. I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to do oh, okay. two okay. because there's two moments that, that really stick in my mind. Every time I think about this movie, one of them is kind of like a fun moment. Um, uh, it, it shows him, it, this is after he's had a couple of months being with this village and with these samurai, he's been learning their ways. There's a, ah, do I want to do three or do I want to skip that? Okay. You know what? can the previous idea there is one scene the most important scene in the movie okay okay the most important scene in the movie is the first time since the battle since his capture that he picks up a sword it's a practice sword which is you know it's just a piece of wood he, he picks it up and fights with one of the warriors so what happens is there's a big rainstorm outside and jeb i'm pretty sure you'll remember this as i'm talking about it yeah, like, I already kind of remember it as you're yeah. talking about it. Once you said rainstorm, I yeah. knew what scene you're talking about. Oh, it's so good. So there's this big rainstorm going on, and he's looking outside. And while he's looking outside, uh, this is earlier on in the movie, uh, he's seeing these uh, these two kids, and they've got their uh, wooden practice swords. And they're just kind of, like, dueling with each other a little bit and practicing. And as he watches them, he, he mentions... They speak different languages, so they don't really understand it. But he's trying to express that he was very impressed by what he was seeing. And then while he's over there trying to communicate that with them, one of the samurai warriors that confronted him out on the battlefield walks up with a practice sword and challenges him to a duel. It's this moment of like he's saying, stay away from our kids. These are our kids. Stay away from them. And so then Nathan picks up one of the practice swords and they have this duel and it's over pretty quickly. The, <laughs> the samurai whoops his butt pretty instantaneously. So the samurai starts to walk away. Nathan kind of gets back up, hobbling a little bit. You know, he's a little stiff, a little sore, but he holds the sword back up and he's ready to go again. So this time lasts a couple longer, a couple more hits in, but... The samurai wins again, and Nathan's on the ground. And he's he's hurting by this point. He's just been hit. He's been hit by a block of wood twice now. And so the samurai again starts to walk away. Nathan gets back up. He gets back up again. He picks up the sword. And he challenges again. And it goes just as well as the previous times. He gets smacked again. He's back on the ground. He's in pain. Uh, and, and this is just coming off of other injuries. He's probably got broken bones that are being re-injured again. But every time he's hit down, he keeps getting back up. And there's one point where this warrior knocks the sword out of his hand. Completely away from him, starts to walk away. And then you hear this shuffling sound in the background. Nathan has crawled back over to the wooden sword again has picked it up and he can barely swing it as a matter of fact he's even dragging it through the mud because he just doesn't have the strength anymore to carry it but he still takes a swing again and that's the moment when the village's opinion of him changed when they realized that no matter how hard he fought he wasn't going to be beaten down by shame he wasn't going to be overcome by the feeling of defeat he would keep fighting until the very end and I found that as an incredibly important point because, you know, number one, it shows just it shows part of his character. He he doesn't mm -hmm. give up because he's been beaten down. But I think the most important thing it does is it fights against this. And I'm. If you're offended by this, I just want to quickly put this out there. Um, suck it. Uh, there is in most Asian cultures, this shame culture where you don't shame the family, you don't shame yourself. 
And a lot of times we see, sadly, that this drives people to committing suicide because they've shamed the family so much this is irredeemable. That moment spat in the face of shame culture and said, stop giving up, push forward, Life is more than this shameful moment. And I found that so encouraging because in our, in, in our lives as believers, it's not our righteousness that saves us. Nope. It's not our righteousness that makes us holy in God's sight. It's the righteousness of Jesus 100% all of the time. So there's no reason for us to give up and stop now. We press on. We keep going because... Jesus is the answer, not us. It's not our works. It's his works. So no matter how many times we fall down, no matter how many times we screw up and we we do the exact thing that we promised we weren't going to do, or no matter how many times that we fail at doing the right thing, we still get up anyways. That's right. So that's, yeah, I would say that that's, that's really the biggest moment for me that really shows some of his his manhood and in that moment while not as a whole he's not really an ideal to strive for that moment is an ideal to strive for i think we should all as as men definitely but as believers in general we should be striving for that kind of a faith that gets up no matter how many times we're beat down that's right and last question what three things if say i I or someone who's never seen this movie before has no idea of this character. What's one to three things you want this new person who's never seen this movie to take away from his character? Probably the biggest thing I'd say right away, I would want them to walk away with this desire to constantly seek the truth. And the reason I say that is because like you watch this man evolve, you watch him change over time. You watch him as he grew up believing one thing, he gr- he grows up on a, it's like, he starts off in a completely different army. But he's so committed to searching his own soul and searching out the truth that when he realizes he's wrong, he switches over. He's committed to the truth. And if you are committed to the truth, then that is going to help sort out a lot of these other questions that you're going to have. If you're, if you're committed to the truth, it's going to help you to understand where you need to be uh, on certain social topics, but especially when it comes to these spiritual topics, are you committed to seeking the truth about whether or not God exists or are you hoping that he doesn't exist so that you don't have to answer for the things in your past that you don't want to admit? I'd say that's probably the first thing I'd hope they come away with Uh, The second thing would be like that scene I was just telling you about, this tenacity to continue to stand up over and over and over. I would want that person to come away and every time that they're hit down for something that's unjust to remember that moment and say, you know what, even though this is not the way it's supposed to be, I'm still going to get up anyways and I'm still going to do the right thing. I've learned the truth at this point, so I'm going to take that and I'm going to continue to fight until I'm not able to stand anymore. Mm. and i'm trying to see if there's a third thing there's it's a hard yeah there's a scene at the end of the movie right before the final battle usually i'm not a fan of final battles i usually think that it's too much hype for too little reward i think this is one of the few times where the final battle actually delivers uh there's a scene right before the end where uh the leader of the samurai rebellion his name is katsumoto Katsumoto is starting to question himself. And you start to see image like little moments of this shame culture appear where he's trying to decide, is it better to die by my enemy's sword or by my own? And Nathan Algren just looks at him and says, then let it be by your enemies. Don't let it be by your own sword that you fall. Let it be by your enemy's sword that you fall. And I love that because, and you know, some, some of that was elaboration, but what I love about that is there's no giving up in his mind. It's fight for what's right until the end is here and there's nothing more to do. He becomes an encourager for those around him. I would say the third thing that you could take away from it 
is once you've sought the truth and once you've built up that tenacity to fight for what's right, learn how to be an encourager like him so that you can take all of those strengths that you've built up in yourself and you can pass them on to somebody else. And that way, you're not just building up your own faith, you're helping to build up somebody else's faith. That way, that person can continue on in the work that God has put before them and continue to bring the word of the Lord to those who've not heard it. All right. Well, Stephen, thank you so much. Thank you for reminding me of this amazing character and movie. Like I said, I'm probably going to go find it and watch it if I if I can. But um, I wonder if it's available. I'm gonna while while you're closing, I'm gonna check to see if it's available anywhere. Okay. But um, yeah. Thank you, y'all, for the audience for listening and for listening to some of Stephen's favorite characters of in movies. And I hope this struck your interest in movies as well. And I hope y'all come back for more movies, more men, and more men who talk for movies. Yes. And as of right now, as of this recording, as of the recording, it's on Netflix. And of course, anytime we do a Man in the Movies segment, you just check up here in the corner, and there is a card that will take you, when it's done, when it's done, to that Men Who Talk Through Movies episode where we do that. All right. So, uh, Stephen, again, thank you. And everyone else who's listening, thank you. And we will see y'all in the next movie as we talk through it. Bye, guys. Bye.